Wow, this is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. I want to speak to you today on how to make a bad day for you a good day for you. Uh, in the Lord, every day is good. In the Lord, every day is good. In the Lord, every day is good. Can you get that? That if you're in the Bible, if you're in his book, if you're putting your, applying yourself to his book is where peace is. I don't know what you have in your house, but I know everybody tells me, well, I got my computer, my telephone, I can do anything on that. Well, if that be the case, find the Bible on your, on your telephone and ask it to show you all the references that are talk about peace in the Bible. And if you want to really hear or learn what it's saying, you get you a pad and a pen. And you write them down. Anything you, you look at verbally, you look at it and you write it down and you speak it verbally. Uh, it gets three things. It gets in your brain. You see it, you say it, and your brain is active in it. And you write it down. And so you're writing it down and you're getting the words. Now, that's the way to study. If you don't study that way, you're not studying at all. More than likely, you're just reading. And just reading uh, won't get what you want. You need to hear. You need to see and you need to hear what you're reading. And so it, you can actually hear it in your ear when you're saying it out loud. You could read it on your computer and then play it back to yourself. And so that you really hear it. But first thing you need to find is where peace is. Peace is only. Let me tell you this, where peace is only. That's two times. Now I'm going to say it one more time. Peace is only in God. There is no peace in this world. None. This world has no peace for you. If you have your TV on and you're watching your television, you are watching a conjunction of a bunch of stuff the devil is feeding to everybody right now. It's feeding everybody a bunch of stuff in their brain that's uh, making them uh, fretful, worried, going crazy, doing all this and that. You don't know what to believe and what not to believe. The devil's a liar. He's the father of lies, by the way. He is the mother of lies. He is the pro uh, generator of lies. He lied first to Adam and Eve and got them cast out of heaven, cast out of the, the uh, perfect earth. And he lied to them. And so uh, you need to come to God, just like this cat's coming to me. This cat's been out for a few hours. Early this morning I put her out. She wanted to go out. And she's just now come in. And, and she's longing to be with me. And she wants some petting. And she wants to be comfortable inside and not out in the fretful world where she's been for a few hours and that's the way we are we're in a fretful world and we've been there for a few days and and uh, i've been there for uh 78 years times 365 i did that the other day and it came out to i don't know 27,000 days or something i've been on the earth and, but I have, I'm having peace in my life in spite of what's going on around me. It's not going to shake my peace because I'm going to stay in the Word. I'm going to stay in the Word, in God's Word. I, I, I just started Psalm 105. I've done the Psalms, if you want to find them. I've done them on uh, my excerpt place, Larry Estes, brother Larry W. Estes at Faith Baptist Church puts them on for me I do not have the education enough to put those on myself so Larry puts them on a place called PH Tidbits on the YouTube it's on that you go to the YouTube and get PH Tidbits and you'll find some sign uh, not just signs you'll find many many messages I put on there uh, many of the days that I put messages on there were actually Probably very, very tough, strenuous days. Very strenuous days. The days during the period that my wife had cancer and was leaving here. 
uh, dying with cancer and I'd get in another room and I'd put the computer on and I would do the excerpts and I would fellowship with God and I would draw my strength from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I married in 1963 so I was married about 57 years and then all of a sudden I'm single again. And uh, but I have all of that those years of love from that woman uh, within my soul and my body, and and I know that that we were a union. God put us together. No other woman would have ever stayed with me when I was a drunk and ugly and 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 a Krauser and all of the things that I was until I got saved in 1972. Now, if you are saved, I mean truly saved, I mean you didn't just say, like I heard a man, and I was at, down at Tony's yesterday, there was a man standing around there cussing like a sailor. Ah, and then he said, oh, I don't have to worry about it, even my old master's got me. My old master in heaven, he's got me, so I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. He, he he is he's fooled himself. He's not saved. Anybody to take the Lord's name in vain or curse to swear is not saved. They may say they are, they may think they are, but they're a long ways from salvation. Salvation cleans you up and gets you ready for the Father in heaven. And he's not the old master, he is the master of the universe. And he is the one that, that will give you and I the peace forever when we leave this earth. We're going to a place to live forever when we leave this earth. Now, in the Bible is the only place that you're going to find the peace of God. Uh, over in Psalm, and I, I'm going to Psalm 105. And this is the one I'm doing today. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Have you given him thanks this morning? Not on this thing. Have you opened a Bible and given him thanks this morning? People are ashamed to open a Bible anymore. They say, well, I got it on my phone. Nobody knows what I'm looking at. Well, if nobody knows what you're looking at, you must be ashamed of what you're looking at. And so, uh, I, I said yesterday, it borderlines to me. It borderlines on rudeness to God for you to bring this to church with you and not your Bible. And by the way, I sat in the balcony for you folks that sat down below. And there are several people in the balcony. And they see you down there. And they see what you're doing with that telephone. You're doing everything but what Bible is. They see you doing, you're still talking conversation. You're having a conversation with somebody outside the church. The preacher's up there. Gave his life, gave 30, 40 hours of his life this week. Putting a message together for you from God. And he's up there working his heart out to give you what you need. And you're down there and you're not hearing anything he's saying because you're being rude. You said, what? You're doing something with your telephone instead of listening to him. You need to get your Bible out. And when he gives a scripture, you need to go find it. I bet to some of you, they are, right now, if I told you to go to 4th John, you would head for it. You'd try to find it. I got news for you. It's not in the book. But if you're not in the book, how are you going to know it's not in the book? You haven't learned those things yet. And so uh, you've got to uh, get in the book. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. And one of those things is now I'm in chapter 105. So I want to make known one of his deeds. What do I do? I have a reference down here that says go to 106 and verse 1. And that would be praise ye the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. If you've been being rude to him, 
and doing any Bible reading that you do do only at church and only on your telephone. You've been being rude to God. And you haven't got in you what you need in you to live. You don't have enough in you to live good. Uh, the many of you right now can say that you don't have enough in you to quit smoking. Many of you can say you don't have enough in you to make you not watch uh, strip movies on TV. And something that's hellish that, that, that you're convicted about. I really shouldn't be watching this. But you haven't got enough Bible in you to keep you from doing that. I would hate to go to a mechanic with my car that didn't know any more about a car than most Christians know about the Bible. The average Christian can't find a, a book. The, te the preachers say go to, to, to Job. They've got no idea where Job is in the Bible. They have to go to the front and look it up and see where it is and then go to it. You say, I didn't know Job was way over there. And then uh, and then he says go to 145 and verse 12. So we're going to do that. We're going to go over to 145 and verse 12. And in, in Psalms. And uh, one nineteen. I got very. I got my old Bible up right now, and my old Bible has got very, very, very thin pages in it. And one forty five, and verse twelve, and my fingers at seventy eight. Don't separate the pages good. So 145 and verse 12 says this. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. And I have another Bible that I'm using. I'm teaching out of two. That had an excerpt at the bottom of that that said look at Maribel. What happened at Meribah? Can any of you tell me what happened at Meribah? That's where the, they came upon water and they were dying of thirst. And the water was bitter. They couldn't drink it. And they said, you have brought us here, Moses, where we're going to die of thirst and we can't drink the water and everything. And Moses said, wait a minute. God is with us. Let's ask him what to do. And God said to Moses, Moses, look over there and see that tree. And Moses said, yes, sir, Lord. He said, pull that tree up and throw it in the water. And Moses pulled that tree up and threw it in the water. He said, y'all go ahead and drink now. Moses' obedience. I don't even know if the tree was any different or anything. But the obedience of Moses to do what God said to do cleansed the water. And if you are obedient, you can get cleansing from many things in life. You can get cleansed from many, many things in your life if you'll be obedient to what God says. How are you going to be obedient if you don't know his book? You've got to know his book. I would hate to go to a doctor that hadn't studied any more than many Christians that I know that say they're Christians. Can you actually, by the word of God right now, prove to somebody you're a Christian? Can you say, I can go right here. Where are you going to go? Well, we'll take the first baby steps. We'll go to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, is that where you went? Is that the first first verse? Tell me another one. Right quick like. Come on. Come on. I want to hear another one. What does Romans say? What does the book of Romans say? And in in about about it. About the salvation. Let's take a look. Let's see. I wrote this in nineteen seventy two. Romans 3, 23. All 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you go to faith, you get one of these out of that truck rack, and you put it in your head and in your heart. You read it all day long. You put it in your head and your heart, and you use it. Get eight or ten of them. If you really want to be, push yourself just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just get 30. Just get 30. 30 is a small number for, for me at Walmart. I can give 100 out there in an hour. Uh, just get 30 out. That will give you about 15 minutes at Walmart, 30 of them. And as the people are walking out, you're walking in that sidewalk between the cars. And as you come to a person just to get in his car, you hand him one of these. And you could witness to him and say, sir, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? And whatever he says, you can say the answer is in this pamphlet. And go to the next car. You haven't got to reiterate or anything. Of course, I try to win him to the Lord right then. God's word is very clear. That all mankind has sinned before a righteous God. That everyone has fallen short of God's standards. That is so simple. It's as plain as a policeman walking up to you, your car, and saying to you, sir, do you know that you only have one headlight? I've only got one headlight right now. I'm ordering one. And uh, you only have one headlight. That's a $100 fine. I said, sir, yes, I do know, and I'm, I've got one ordered, but it's coming. And so... Uh, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and 23. What does wages mean? Wages means payment. So the Bible says all sin leads to death. There wasn't going to be any death for Adam and Eve until sin came in. And then they, sin came in and separated them from God. And so death came in. The third thing is God commended his love toward us, you and me. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I would suggest, if you are a Christian, especially if you're a new Christian, that you would go over and get your concordance and look in there and find out what book it is that where Jesus was put on the cross. And go to that scripture. If you dig it out yourself, if I tell you where it is, that's no good. If you dig it out yourself, you'll know where it is from now on. It will be etched in your mind. The trouble is with us today, we want to be lazy and we ask somebody, where is so-and-so? And they tell you, and you go to it. But if you hunted for it and dug it out, then you'll know where it is. And you'll be able to recall it. And then God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, died for our sins, made the payment for you on the cross and for me. He made the payment. Oh, if you could only see the suffering that the cross put on a human being. And Jesus, God in the flesh, came down here in a fleshly body and was born. The agony of the cross. The hours hanging on the cross before the three hours of darkness that came on the earth. The hours before that was a couple, three hours he's hanging on the cross. Every few, every few seconds, minute, a minute, maybe a minute and a half, he's going to die of suffocation. So he has to use all, every single drop, of the strength that he can muster in his arms and his feet to push himself up a little bit and to pull up a little bit to get one breath. And that's it. And then when he sags back down, he's not breathing anymore. His breath is cut off. You would get frantic. If you put your hand over your mouth until you couldn't breathe anymore, you will get frantic. And then you... To pick your hand up and get one breath. Go like that again. And it's going to be but a few seconds. You're frantic again. You can't get in here. And then you try that a few times. Just think on the cross. They had to pull themselves up. They had left. 
They put the heels up in the air on the cross, and their heels were up against the cross. And the Bible talked about it would bruise his heel, it bruised it to the bone. And the bone was actually hurting. He had worn all the skin off it, pulling himself up and down. That was a natural thing to do for somebody dying to get, to just get one more gulp of air. God's gift to you was his son, Jesus. He was, he was Jesus who died on the cross for you, and it is Jesus who gives you eternal life. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is possible only through Jesus, God's Son. If you believe in Jesus and receive him as your Savior, the Bible says you can be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But after salvation, what comes? It's like when the baby was born. When you were a baby and you were born, you, the first thing they did is they cleaned you up. That's the first thing you do after salvation. You clean up. Get all of the trash off your life. All of the booze and the cussing and the wild women chasing and all of the stuff that you did while you were a man or if you're a woman all the man chasing and all the stuff and the thoughts you had and everything get all that out of your life and get started on a new track that's with the bible god did something for me special after i got saved <coughs> when i got saved in 1972 i couldn't read i got the bible on tape and uh, no, I didn't either. I got the Bible on record, excuse me, on record. I think I still have it. And uh, I put the record on, and I put the headphones on, and I got the, this very Bible right here. This is the very Bible I got in 1972. I got it out, and I started listening. And I got me some markers, and I started marking. And I marked my pages as I listened to it. And I read along with it. And I would try to read the words. As Alexander Scorby would say the words, I tried reading them. And I went through the whole Bible in 1972. Right after, right just, just after my salvation, I went through the Bible. And, and all the way through. And... And I went through the whole Bible. And the Old Testament, too. You can see those are all marked, too. Every one of them. Every page. I went through every page of the Bible. That's God's Word. Well, they say, Brother Peter, how much of that you think you retained? Well, I put it all in my bank up there. And God can bring me recall when He when He wants to. But what you have to do is you have to read through it again. A few times, and I've read through it again a few times since I was saved. And I've studied many passages many times since I got saved. Where I am right now at 78, I'm where recall is going down the hill, or the sun on the other side of the mountain. Now, when I was on this side of the mountain, recall was coming up. Now I'm on the other side of the mountain, recall is going down, so I'm having to study. A little bit harder in one sense of the word, but a little bit easier in another sense of the word because I went to school uh, over here at uh, Titus Baptist Seminary and got one of those uh, degrees in, in theology. And uh, I got the certificate to prove it. And God opened the door for that and made that where, it was, where I was able to do that. Here I am, an eighth grade dropout. I was 18 years old when I graduated the 8th grade, and I joined the Navy. The next day, I joined the Navy when I got out of school. He say, 18, you were some dummy. I was, but I was a dummy for many reasons. One reason was 
my daddy never we never went to one school I don't think more than I think maybe the maximum I ever went to one school was in the first second third fourth fifth grade maybe I went to just one room school with uh, six grades in one room and uh, uh, I was in the, the f first through fifth there I think and then after that I never went to a school a whole year we'd go half a year and then move go another half a year to another school and go somewhere else daddy was a traveling preacher and we didn't have a place to live and travel so we'd go and have to live in a place while we were there preaching so and that's the way that worked but anyway back to back to the school I went to I said this the other day on the YouTube what I learned in the first grade was what the fifth grade was learning that uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public for which it stands, indivisible, with liberty and with death and justice for all. And then I, and then we learned, believe it or not, we learned the Constitution of the United States. We learned a preamble, and we learned many other things. And we all said them every day in the morning before school started. Everybody stood up and pledged the flag. And said all of these things. Another thing we did. I was the water tender. I was the one that went down to the well. And the well was probably 75 to 100 yards from the school. And the school was up on a rock. Up on top of a rock. And there was a path with some little steps up. And you could go down and get with your bucket and get it. And bring your bucket of water up. We had one dipper hanging there. Everybody drank from the same dipper. Whenever you wanted a drink, you raise your hand, the teacher say what, and you say I want a drink, and she said go ahead. And you'd go up and dip the dipper and get a drink of water and hang a dipper back up. And uh, another thing we did, we had hygiene t checks. I would teach her in the morning. We line all lined up and go by her, and she look at her ears, behind her ears, look at her neck, uh, and look at us, and. Uh, write a little note and say put this in your pocket and give it to your mother and that little note would say this you sent this boy to school dirty <laughs> so don't do it again and I'll send him home and so uh, yeah those were days when when school was school and uh, and we learned I learned probably more in my first five years of school than I learned in all the rest of the school years that I went to school and uh, uh, so uh, that's the way God worked in those days for us and we knew uh, we lived near an Air Force base I was uh, I was privy or I was privileged to know or to hear the first time the sound barrier was broke in the state of Maine. And uh, we lived near an Air Force base in Brunswick, Maine. And uh, the jets would come over and they'd break the sound barrier. Well, they loved doing that. All oh, those pilots loved doing that. And they knew if they did it a little bit closer than they were supposed to, that it would break your windows. It would shake the doors off your cabinets. It would knock the dishes out of your cupboard. It was a sonic boom that would actually shake your house. It was just like a bomb going on. And they liked doing that, so we experienced that. But I lived in the state of Maine. I had some good times in my life. We ended up moving from our school zone where I was going to school in that one-room schoolhouse. So uh, I had to walk to school. And that walk across the granite ledges, I would go up over a mountain, across the granite ledges, back down, cross the road, and go through the granite ledges and come out at the school. It would take me about an hour, hour and 15 minutes every morning to walk to school. And so I did that. And I got to know all the moose along the way. Uh, moose are dorsal animals until it's breeding time. It's not a good time to be around them at any other time. They'll just look at you and go back to eating. And it, it, it doesn't frighten them, and they don't frighten you. And so they're a docile animal, even though they're big, huge, and clumsy. And so anyway, I walked to school, and I still was the water carrier. I was the first one there. I built the fire every morning. We lived in that one-room schoolhouse, and it was wintertime. 
we had to stop the woodshed full of wood and uh, that was something we did as children the men would pull up down at the street and we would all go down and get an arm full of wood and bring it up and put it in a woodshed and we'd make a big circle and we'd keep going around until we got the woodshed full we were working children we were children that did something we knew something we learned that you had to work to stay warm that you had to work to live we learned that in our first years of school we learned many things they're not teaching anymore they're saying oh it would be wrong for me to look behind my children's ears and see if they're dirty they say, oh, it would be wrong to work that child. I had him go actually bring an armful of wood in or do something. It would be wrong. No, I, that was all the right things to do. We have left the right things off in this world and got on the wrong side. And now we've made people lazy and slothful and uh, all kinds of things. And, but anyway, back in the Word. If you don't learn anything but this little track, you get your one. If you don't go to Faith Baptist Church, your church may have a track. And if it doesn't, come by faith, come in the vestibule, and get a handful of these. I know they say say faith, they say Faith Baptist Church on them. But if you're a Christian, it doesn't matter whose church it says on them. We preach the same gospel if we preach Jesus Christ and Him only. That's what we're supposed to preach. Jesus Christ and Him only. And that's it. This is a fr I would hate to be in the position some of you are in because this is a fretful day. And what is bringing on more fret than is necessary is this thing right here. I'm glad that I do not know how to get on it and do anything other than talk. And that's all I know how to do is answer it and call somebody. And that's that's enough. And, and so uh, it, it doesn't worry me. I've got my Bible. And I'm going to use my Bible until I die. As a matter of fact, uh, I've got about 26 Bibles behind me here. And I've got the only real Bible that I have, the only real Bible I have, is the King James Version. This is the real Bible. I see people in the bookstore. I'm, all the time I go to Barnes & Noble and I watch people buying Bibles. They're looking for something easy to read. And that's not what you need. What you need is something that's truthful. You need the King James Version Bible. It's truthful. It has no errors in it. It's an errorless book. This book right here has no errors in it. None. No errors. It's a perfect book. It's the only perfect Bible that was ever published. And so, it's a perfect Word of God. <clears throat> and you can depend on it. You say, how do you know you can depend on it? I can take any verse out of here that is going to bless me. And it will bless me. I can take any verse out of here that shows what will curse me. And if I do what that says, it will curse me. And I can do what Jesus said. Anything Jesus said in here is truthful. That's what he did say. And that's how he said it. Now we have Bibles out here today that have changed the words that Jesus said. And you can change one word and change a sentence. That's right. So you had to be careful how you change words, especially in God's Bible. Wow, I was only supposed to be on here 15 minutes, and it's 34 minutes gone by now. I'm going to get off. But my suggestion to you is to hang your phone on the rack, get your Bible out, get your notebook out, and ask God to show you what to look for. Get some of the excerpts that I do out. Get some of the scriptures that I quote out, and... Find them for yourselves and read what they say. If you get this good KJV with some help notes, it will tell you places you need to go. See, behind every one of these verses is a reference to another verse. And that reference is the chain. This is an unbroken chain. This King James Version is an unbroken chain. It's linked together. 
every verse has verses before it and verses after it that link to it. And it's an unbroken chain. If you please, it's an unbroken ribbon. It is the ribbon of God. It is that scarlet thread, the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He died for this book so we could have this book. He died for you and I and so that we could have this book. He gave us this book. This is his manual for us. He saved us and gave us a manual. And his manual is the only manual that's a true manual. And he sanctioned this King James Version. Many, 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 many men died to get this book out. Because when they found them copying it or writing it, they killed them back in that day. So it took something to get this book out. And uh, the first one was ran on that Gutenberg Press in Germany. And uh, we got it. And uh, a great man uh, pioneered the way to do it and did it. So let me uh, check out of here if I didn't already. I guess I did. No, I didn't already. So let me check out of here. And I'll see you next time. Right. Bye-bye.